before I became a super weeb and got into the anime figure collecting hobby, my first love was JRPGs, especially Genzo Sukuden. I even started my own dedicated Sukuden channel, Sukuden 6 for lore, character, news updates for the upcoming Sukuden HD remake. Check it out, I'll put it in the link below. JRPGs, my boy today, the gaming shelf, I know he loves his Persona 4 and I knew I had to talk to him. He is a big JRPG news reviewer, he does fantastic videos on YouTube about hidden gems, some of the best RPGs, especially JRPGs you'll ever find. He chronicles Fire Emblem series and all the good stuff. Please check out his channel, it's my good friend Taylor with me today. JRPGs. <laughs> Hey everyone and welcome to the Miyazaki Man podcast. I'm delighted to be joined by Taylor from The Gaming Shelf. How are you doing, my man? Doing good, Simon. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. No, I can tell we're already going to bond. I'm loving that Lego Goku shirt. Where where did you get that from? <laughs> oh yeah, I had to bust this out. Yeah, I um, I taught South uh, uh, English in South Korea for a year and they had this whole brand that this is like what they made. And so a uh, big Dragon Ball fan had to make sure I picked that up when I was out there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So English in, in Korea, wow. Did you have the choice between different Asian nations or did you specifically go for Korea or how did that come about? Yeah, no, I had a um, I had a buddy I was really good friends with in high school that was from Korea and he had to go back to do his uh, military service. And so when he was getting oh. out, he was like, oh, you know, you're just finishing up college, you should come out. And so, um, yeah, it was honestly one of the best years of my life. It was so much fun. Absolutely. Exploring different kind of horizons and new adventure. Like, would you ever go back there to stay kind of long term or is, is one year enough? You know, I, I'm i wondering if that time has come and gone for me. I, I wanted to at one point. I, I almost wanted to go back immediately, but I had trouble finding another place. And then they, they changed the qualifications and background checks and stuff. So it made it really challenging to do it. And, but um I, and then I was almost going to do a business out there with that same friend, but again, it just Ooh. it didn't work out. So, uh, but I definitely want to visit again. Sure, indeed, yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, myself, I followed a similar kind of journey. So I, I taught for a year in in Japan. Uh, that's where I, I met my missus. She came back with me to the UK for a good six, seven years. And then we only decided to come back to our hometown last year. But even in that kind of duration, uh, you know, I've been playing a lot of the games and getting my backlog cleared, you know, bit by bit. But my goodness, wow, the backlog keeps growing. Like what are the games on your backlog that are highest priority right now that you, you need to get to? You know, I got to be honest with you. I am not one of those people that has a backlog because I the way my channel works, I have to just keep moving forward and play the new games. And I, you know, there are games that are I would say like because of the type of channel I have I should be like some of the really older games like Final Fantasy 6 and 4 I sh I need to get to Earthbound and oh, Xenogears yes. I guess I've played all those games but never finished them but to me mm. they're not like a priority if like if it's like a slow month and I have literally nothing to play like maybe I'll I'll consider it but I I I know people have their their backlog list but for me I try to I try to just ignore it and just kind of plow forward with whatever's new <laughs> the current trends the hype so of course we have to talk about fire emblem engaged then is that the current uh flavor of the month yeah definitely um that's i'm actually kind of working on a video right now for that so uh yeah but play that all weekend really really loving it i know people are kind of not a fan of the more like cutesy art style and kind of more light-hearted tone in this new one compared to three houses but i kind of love it <laughs> That's kind of my thing. Um, and I like the the combat and the map design it, to me is way better than three houses. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm digging it. Have you have you played it at all? Or are you trying it right now? So I, I installed it and I was going to give it a first go yesterday. I just was about to name the character and then my little one woke up. And then, yeah, that was the end of that story. So, <laughs> so yeah. I, I've yet to really, really get my, my teeth into it. But it's very funny and interesting how the, the perception of it changed over time. So you remember when the leaks came out and it was the, the character's hair piece. I was like, whoa, toothpaste, mm. Colgate, what's going on here, right? And then they saw the trailers, the gameplay, the music, the characters, and people started to come around to it. And were like, this actually looks pretty good, pretty cool. We're forgetting about all the controversy now. And then now that it's actually out... As you said, it's quite mixed, you know, mixed in terms of the kind of reception of it. Why, why do you think that is? Um, I think, I mean, it's like with every new game, right? Like, especially because it was on Switch. I think Three Houses was a lot of people's first Fire Emblem. And mm. that had a very, 
it was very story heavy and it was very like a dark and serious tone and so i think people were like oh this is what fire emblem is and then you come here mm -hmm. and it's like almost the opposite <laughs> and so i i think and then i i think also people feel like maybe it's trying to be a fan service game because you have all the emblem heroes they're bringing back all the pr yeah. protagonists from the past game so i think people feel like they're just trying to cash in on that or something. I, I don't know. And then also, I, I don't know if you remember this, but when it first got announced, people thought it was a mobile game because of the logo. Oh, yeah, yeah. The logo looked like a mobile game. And so mm. I think there was that. Obviously, it's, it was never a mobile game, but I think there was that initial bad taste maybe. Um, and I think just the general audience outside of Japan is not a fan of like the cutesy anime look. Like if we do, if they sure. do like the dark anime look or something like we were talking about tales like tales of arise i think is like a good mix between like photo reel and anime and stuff like that so I, I just think it i think it depends yeah that makes sense to me a lot of people did think it was a kind of gacha kind of natural successor to fire emblem heroes did you ever play that that game on the mobile yeah i played it a, a little bit um with from a lot of mobile games i they just don't usually stick with me although the one that i did like they recently just turned off was called um dragalia lost i don't know if you've oh, heard yes, of that yes. i'm aware yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed that one quite a bit. And I was sad when they when they took it down. Mm. But, uh, you know, all games will get shut down eventually. <laughs> Absolutely. But the, the kind of memories linger on, the characters, the kind of music, the art. The art in Dragalia Lost was really, really nice as well. So, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. I've committed way too much uh, time and, and resources into Gacha <laughs> games. So I'm trying to put that one on hold for now. But at least with, like, um, a console game, a platform game, you can really you know, get your money's worth on it, but they're kind of really dishing out the DLC, like day one DLC as well for, for the games coming out. What's your kind of take on that? Yeah, that's, mm, that's interesting. I, I, I'm of two minds. Like as a player, it's frustrating that it's not in there because they had, I believe what the, what, what it was, you had the three houses characters that you could have mm -hmm. as emblem heroes and then Tiki, who's sort of like a recurring character. And then obviously there will be like, there's three other waves that are coming down the line. Yeah. From a development standpoint, I get it, right? Because like they're trying to like games are more expensive than they've ever been to make, but the prices have not really gone up until like PS5, you know. So mm. I get that they're trying to like offset the costs, and you know, hey, if you don't want it, you don't need it, and I think the game's perfectly fine if you don't buy it. You're not, I mean, you you have you're missing out on some characters, but I'm enjoying it so far. I don't feel like I'm missing anything out. Um, so. I'm not bothered. I know it bothers a lot of other people, but I. But again, I, I also used to work for a game developer, so I understand mm -hmm. the the cost of making a game, and that you need to offset that somehow. So I get it. Absolutely, absolutely, and I guess that's the kind of thing that a lot of um, normal consumers don't appreciate the kind of commercial aspects of it. People think it's you know greedy mm -hmm. developers and whatnot, but there are real costs to consider. You know, you got to monetize your kind of product. That's why all the budget goes into marketing and getting it out there. And uh, yeah, for, for me, you know, DLC isn't forced upon you. It's a, a consumer choice, right? You've got, you have a choice to spend or not. Whereas people think, no, nah, I've got to get it. I won't get the full experience otherwise. But literally, you know, you are pressing the button to buy that, that extra product. So <laughs> no, that, and that's, that you're hundred percent right. Like nobody's forcing you to buy it. It's not like, uh, and I think a lot of times too, people think like, let me, let's carve out the game and then set it mm -hmm. aside. And when it, when it comes out on day one, I can see how people would think that because it could easily have been put in there but but again at the same time I, I for this game in particular i don't think you know i don't think you're getting a lesser game or whatever indeed yeah yep yeah, i hear you and to me kind of 2000 to end of 2022 but 2023 this current year it seems to be the golden age of of the rpg coming to the prominence you know mm. the the real return of the big series for me genzo 3 coden is my favorite series of all time mm. kind of changed my life the hd remake so funny that it coincided with kind of auden 100 heroes uh the release of that bunny bunny and rabbit studios or tiger and rabbit or something like that um what what's your experience of, of that series and that that game yeah i, I think like most people i played the first two and really uh enjoyed the first two um even like going back to play them now I, I think they hold up really well just because they were so unique compared to wow. a lot of the other rpgs that were coming out at the time like obviously you can't compare it to like final fantasy because that was like the top of the game at the time right cool. but you know the this idea of like having your home base and you're collecting all these characters that would fill out your base and um i don't know i just thought that was so unique and i and i'm really there's not a series that really does that still obviously you didn't chronicle but it's kind of the same people <laughs> so it's uh, it's not quite the same but um yeah I'm, I'm super excited that they're um 
that they're bringing back the HD collection so more people can play those games, especially because they're so expensive. Like, I don't know if you've looked like on eBay or what what, what it's like in Japan, but they're oh, really yeah, expensive yeah. to get like a hard disc copy of those games. So, um, they can be. yeah, yeah. They so can the fact that sure. they're bringing them back in a more affordable package is nice. It's very good, especially because you can continue to save data from game to game and lock, unlock exclusive from the different uh, different um, previous games. That That's really, really useful. And in terms of like my access to them from when I was a child, my dad actually owned, I think, one of the first uh, import game stores in the UK, which is how I got my hands on them in the, in the first instance. And then, um, yeah, I was absolutely hooked. And one of the things about Genzo Tsukuden that I found really, really unique so in Final Fantasy, you've got a protagonist against evil, against a monster, against, you know, whereas in Sukuden, it's, there's no right or wrong. You're just opposite sides of the war, you know, telling your own story, protecting your own hometown. It's that kind of feel that you can just somehow really get emotionally attached to even the, the more evil, you know, characters. Is that the kind of feeling that you took away from it as well? I almost think those types of villains are more, or I don't even know if you want to call it a villain, but those types of uh encounters or yeah. yeah i think that's just more interesting because there's more mm -hmm. like personal stakes there as opposed to like oh a god trying to destroy the world like, okay. <laughs> exactly we've yeah. seen that a million times so something more more intimate like that i think is is definitely more interesting absolutely and one of the things that really to this day kind of emotionally affects me as well is the music especially from genzo strakudan 2 because that thing was spread over four cds that had a lot of tracks in there that's unusual to me do you know any other games that has such a huge ost four i mean pr i mean probably some final fantasy but that's yeah. that's impressive i can't I, I can't remember a game off the top of my head because even like the ps1 final fantasies like i have all those soundtracks i think they're two th three at most discs so for mm. it to be four is impressive probably because each individual character had their own theme or something would be my guess but I, i'm not totally sure um but yeah no that's that's impressive absolutely and and for such an old game as well so one, one of my dreams kind of came true last year around my birthday in october so um i asked the missus you know one off we got two little kids to look after but can i go to tokyo there's a sakudan poem to Sukun Requiem Philharmonic Orchestra live in mm. the uh, Tokyo Orchestra Hall. She said, okay, fill your boots out, off you go. <laughs> Brought an empty suitcase, you know, shop, shopping around in, in Tokyo. When I went to that hall there, Sukuden is such an old game, but do you know who the genre, or who, who the main audience was comprised of in terms of age group and female and male and type of person? Have a guess at who, who the main target audience was. I mean... Logic would say like people like us, like people that grew up mm. playing it. But if you're asking that question, I'm guessing it was the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> well deduced, yeah. So it's roughly like 20 to 30 year old girls, Interesting. comprised of 80 percent of the audience. And I'm thinking, were they even around when it first came out? I was really, really <laughs> surprised. But uh, it was wow, the, the feels there. Like I was next to some kind of yakuza, kind of gangster looking badass guy, and a really oh, old grandma and they were bawling myself as well bawling their tears out you know you got a big screen and exclude i should have taken some um footage of it but obviously i wanted to enjoy the experience but there was really a lot of exclusive um previews into the hd remake that's not been announced on any trailer or anything yet so i got a oh. sneak peek at a lot of the um gems and it is they they put the effort into that it looks really really good <laughs> Wow, that's that's really fascinating. I uh, is I wonder if it has something to do with like because of the type of music or like maybe some musician is popular with young females, younger females. I don't know. That's that's really interesting to hear. Yeah, yeah. I I was absolutely shocked. Or it could just be that it's that kind of age group that likes to go out and about and socialize and you know, well, we've got a concert there, shall we go? Yeah, why not? <laughs> so. Let me ask you this. I I feel like in Japan there's that type of thing is more common like uh we, I, I wouldn't say laugh or mock, but like there's those persona stage plays, right? Where it's like almost yes. like a persona musical, which like we would never get out here. So like, mm. is that just a more common like thing to go out and do is to see like game stuff like that in Japan? Or is that still I, like kind of off the beaten path a little bit? I, I think so, to be honest, right? So you've got loads of secondhand book off stores in, in Japan, which sell loads of kind of weeby content. And one thing that's really, really big in Japan is visual novels. So for the girls especially, right, you, they play so many visual novels and Switch games and mobile games, you know, and it, mm. it doesn't necessarily have to be all girly and princessy. Some of them are pretty badass and pretty kind of <laughs> kind of anime related. And I think it's, it's that kind of hybrid conversion that brings the girls into that kind of gaming scene. And you'll find a lot 
of girl gamers in Japan. Obviously, they may not be like super hardcore gamers, but they're kind of casual gamers, and they're they're not kind of prone to going to these kind of um, live theatre performances of Death Note or or <laughs> Final Fantasy or these reenactments. And for them, it's just a fun time going out with their friends. And I think you're right. I wouldn't find that in the UK or in the Western world. It just doesn't exist. But here, there's a kind of acceptance that everyone can just play games. Anyone can watch anime. It's inbred in Japan itself that it's part of the culture. So, yeah, I'd never thought about that. But that's that's really true. They're just more open to that kind of thing. Mm, that's neat. <laughs> yeah, especially because when you're trying to find a partner and if she likes games and understands your need for playing games and spending the time and that kind of thing, that's ideal. <laughs> yeah, does your, um, does your wife, does she play games and into anime and all that stuff? So she likes her anime. Um, she played the occasional game, but I would say she loses interest, not just in games, but in anything very quickly. She likes to move on to the next thing. So something like mm. an RPG, I couldn't imagine her going through. But then again, she's played more Dragon Quest. Well, I've only played or started Dragon Quest Eleven on Switch. She's played like three Dragon Quest games, not long, maybe like for a week or so. But uh, yeah, she's actually um, played a few decent games, but I, I wouldn't take her opinion with much, uh, <laughs> with much <laughs> serious opinion. She'll be like, that character's cute. That character's strong. Wow, look at that slash. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about your your family? Are they into games as well? Um, my male cousin, who's like close to my age, like we, we bond over stuff like that, but most of my family is not really into games. I've had the uh find the community with my channel or on discord or yeah. twitter or whatever but um yeah my cousin is big into like the rpg like western rpg stuff like witcher oh, and fallout yeah, yeah. and stuff like that so we can uh every once in a while i'll try to push some some japanese stuff on him but uh yeah he's more into those into the western style rpgs <clears throat> yeah no you're funny that you mentioned that because like um so my dad's side of the family is vietnamese and we all grew up in cambridge england and his side of the family has like seven sisters and one brother and each one of them has about two to three children so my portfolio of cousins in cambridge was vast so every month birthday parties usually we played like kind of street fighter beat em ups mm. kind of party games as well but all of them got into various different rpgs i remember we played like vandal hearts we played azure dreams skies of arcadia secret of mana with a multi-tap so kind of these old school kind of, yeah. kind of games together that that was the peak that was so fun you know after school and whatnot that multi-tap that multi-tap was genius idea back on the super famicom snes days did you ever play secret of mana multiplayer no, you know, I got to be honest, I didn't really get into RPGs until like the PlayStation era, like and okay. the Super Nintendo, it was more like Street Fighter or uh, like sports games or like Mario, like the the, the casual games, if you will, yeah. that like everybody played. But yeah, it wasn't until PlayStation that I really got into mm -hmm. that. So I've going back to some of the um, some of the earlier like Super Nintendo games is tough unless the game is really good like chrono trigger or something oh, like yes. that otherwise the rest sometimes the pacing can be a little bit harder but i, I mean i know they're classics and I, I know people love them so i i hope to you know finish them at some point absolutely yeah maybe a hd remake of chrono trigger that will definitely uh, appease <laughs> the masses <laughs> i'm surprised they haven't done it already i don't know what the what the hold up is so here's here's my thoughts on that could it possibly be that they're trying to do a big scale Final Fantasy VII remake style of Chrono Trigger? Now that will be a bombshell because people will be like, no, remake the original one as is, you know, don't <laughs> go full length. But could they be trying a big production value of that? Is that a possibility? It's possible. I mean, anything's possible. I, th I think if if I had my say, which doesn't mean anything, but like I think <laughs> the HD 2D style that they've been doing with like Octopath and Triangle oh, yeah. Strategy and stuff, I feel like that would fit better just because mm. I think people are so attached to that pixel style. Yeah, so yeah. I, I think that would be a good middle ground of like, hey, you can appease the old school fans, but then also keep it somewhat modern. Um, but you know, you never know. They could be, um, there could also be uh, a big, a big AAA mm. style remake. I mean, I, I'd take either, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even both. If they're going full commercial cash cow, they're going to release one after the other. <laughs> Well, it's almost like what they did with Dragon Quest XI. I couldn't believe they did this, but they have like a, a retro mode or whatever where you can oh, play yeah, right. with yes. a pixel yeah, style. Yeah. That was, in, they basically made the game twice. I couldn't believe they did that. That was insane. <laughs> yeah, that's completely right. They've done it with a few games. Like, I don't know if you know a series called Steins Gate, Steins Gate on the Switch. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so they've done a similar thing. You can play the 8-bit version of, of that as well. And that's oh, really? really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Huh. And um, you mentioned Octopath Traveler. So... 
in that kind of game where there's various paths, would you say that you're a completionist, that you try to do all the characters to go to the end of the story, or do you do the main ones and, and then go to the next game? Uh, for stuff with Octopath specifically, I, I went and did everything just because yeah. uh, I really enjoyed that game. Now they're, they have, you know, that's derived from like the Saga games, which I don't really like. Um, and even to some extent, like Live Alive, I know we just got a remake oh, yeah. for that. Um, so I, I think it depends on how much I enjoy it and like if there is some payoff at the end. Like I know with Live Alive, there was more of like a, hey, let's all come together. And with Octopath, mm -hmm. there wasn't. So um, although I, I will say that I probably save my least favorite characters for last just just because that's how that goes. But uh, no, I try to I try to get through all the paths if possible. Yeah quality indeed indeed and if you were like stuck on a desert island you could only play one game for the rest of your life every other game oh man no access to which one is the one you take which is the one with the replay value the sentimental value that will just keep you keep you going keep you surviving until we're rescued off that island that is a good question because yeah like you said it'd have to be something with replay value because it wouldn't be something that uh like a favorite game because that would get boring or it, it, there's only so much you can do in it after a while, um, honestly, it would probably be something like uh, Minecraft, maybe, just because <laughs> you can sort of make your own game or there's so much that you yeah. can do with it, and there's just infinite possibilities. I don't really play Minecraft, to be honest, but um, I've dabbled in it, but I just think there would be so many possibilities of not being bored for a while, I guess, <laughs> that that would probably be the one, just to, just to keep it fresh. That's a great, great answer, because creativity is endless right you can keep yourself entertained for days so yep thinking outside the box i like it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what about what about if you could only listen to one game soundtrack for the rest of the life what is the, uh, uh, the that one's that one's much easier i would probably say chrono cross um chrono cross, yeah. the chrono cross has such a variety Nitsuda. of music on that soundtrack because it's like there's like nice piano music and then there's like tropical music and then there's oh, yeah. Like the the genres are just all over the place in a good way, so um, that that would probably be Chrono Cross, yeah. Makes sense to me. I was I was listening to Chrono Cross before we we jumped on air, so. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> great answer, great answer. What what's your favorite track from Chrono Cross? The top three tracks from that OST. Uh, oh, the okay. So there's um, one would probably be another Termina, which is sort of like it's. It's got a weird mix of instruments. It's got like the castanets and then it's got like a bagpipe. Um, yeah. It's very strange, like when you on paper, but you listen to it and it's just so fun and lively. Like every time I listen to it, it just like puts me in a good mood. So probably another Termina. Um, the starting vi Arnie Village, the starting song. I mean, that one's like mm. just really calm and chill. I really like Arnie Village. And then probably. Uh, the one that comes to mind is uh, it's called Star Stealing Girl, I think. It's like yep, a very chill like, like piano yeah. song. So yeah, it would probably be those three. <laughs> Absolutely. Good choice. Good choice indeed. I'm I'm a sucker for that opening tune, Time Scar. I don't know. That just really ah. brings back the feels. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. And like in terms of the kind of... Um, gaming music and and the story and and the kind of emotional impact and attachment which story for you out of all rpgs do you really kind of relate to and really dig and like wow that story how could someone conjure up how could they think of that you know that ending that resolution that turning point that payoff mm. which is the story for you that you really dig um probably the one in my favorite game which would be persona 4 i just mm. love that theme the whole theme of that game is like facing your true self so like every dungeon basically is like a character's journey through their own psyche trying to come to grips with like these feelings or parts of themselves that they don't like but it, but then at the end it's always like oh you know what you're a part of me that's okay it doesn't make me a bad person it doesn't make oh, me yeah. weird like let me just accept that and then let's move on and i just really like that because i think most jrpgs are like oh let's kill god let's do you know oh, power yeah, friendship yeah, yeah. whatever but that one i think is uh and then specifically some of those specific character journeys i could really relate to um so yeah i, I would say um persona 4 i just thought that was a really um powerful theme for a game Absolutely. I did like that story as well. Did you watch the animation, the anime series of it? I did. You know, I like the anime 
uh, it's one of my favorite anime, honestly, mm-hmm. just because it gives the main character a personality, and he's so funny. Like, he is. <laughs> uh, 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 without spoiling too much, my like, there's this one scene where they go to um, like a nightclub and they like yeah. get drunk or whatever, yeah, and yeah. like it's so funny. Like that's the best scene in the whole anime. It's hilarious. Have I, you I seen the I, anime? I know what you mean? Yeah, I, I know. I know the one you mean. That oh, <laughs> that brings back the kind of flashbacks. But there is one scene for me that rivals that. Do you remember when they went to the um, hot spring and he got the choice to stand your ground or run away? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that was another good <laughs> one. Yep. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah, classics, classics, and the Persona series like it's now become larger than life. You know, they kind of kicked mm. it off the kind of Persona Three, Persona Three Fairs. Persona 4 brought that kind of new interactive kind of storytelling element to it. And then Persona 5 became larger than life. How, how did they do that? How did they turn around the fortunes of that series and make it, you know, mainstream? Yeah, you know, well, okay, so here, this is my take. I, I, I remember when Persona 4 Golden came to Vita and everybody loved it, right? And it was, I think it's still the highest reviewed game on Vita. I could be wrong. And probably one of the best selling games on Vita. Um, and so I think there was a lot of positive momentum and buzz with that game. And so, and they didn't go right into Persona 5, though. They went into Catherine, which yes. um, showed what they could do visually. And I'm like, oh, mm. my gosh, if Persona is going to look like this, this is going to be the best thing ever. Because it had so much style and it, you know, it kind of got out of that PS2 yeah. era. And then I'll never forget when they dropped the first like gameplay trailer for Persona 5 and it was like trending worldwide. And the funny Mm. thing is people couldn't stop talking about the menus of all things. (laughs) And like, I still find it funny that people have cosplayed as the menus. Like think of another game where people cosplay as a menu, like there are none, right? (laughs) And so I, I think a recipe for a good hype cycle is you got to come out and look incredible, right? Because that's the first thing people are going to notice. And I think Persona 5 had such a stunning, like, stylish look to it. So people... Stylish, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I think people couldn't help but get attached to that. I think there was a lot of positive vibe from uh, Persona 4. So I'll I'll tell you a a story that I think is a perfect indicator of this. So do you remember an event called the PlayStation Experience? I know that was only in America, but okay. Yeah. So they... So I went to that, I think it was 2016. And so Sega had a booth. And so it was like Persona 5, Yakuza. And then on the other side, it was whatever the latest Sonic game was. Mm. And the line for Persona 5 was so long that it weaved around and wrapped around the whole Sega booth. And it was so long that they had to shut down this because nobody was playing the Sonic game. Only people wanted to go to Persona. And to me, I was like, no, like it was like a no dust situation. Like it was shocking to me how nobody knew that it was going to be big Mm. um but and then obviously like it it came out and it had um it it had that to me it's that gameplay cycle of like hey let's go dungeon crawling and let's do the life sim aspect and and i think there's a really good like addictive balance to that because there's always something to do like you never if you're bored with dungeon crawling oh let's go hang out with our friends let's go do our part-time job yeah whatever yeah totally and so i just i think Persona 5 was like the the perfect balance of that with visuals that were modern and flashy. So and yeah, music I, I, and, and the Phantom Fee theme oh. and my goodness, they they've like they've scored so highly in making a fantastic combination that works so well together and the authenticity of the Japanese lifestyle going around a town, Shinjuku, the train station, the mm-hmm. school, it feels so authentic. Oh, totally. And I'm sure you can, you know, relate to that more than me. I've been to Japan like for three days, <laughs> but so no, I haven't <laughs> seen a ton of it. But yeah, no, it, I feel like it captures that, um, that it captures that really well. And and I think the important thing, too, is that it. I think a lot of times it's, it's like you were saying, like, how did they get so big? I think sometimes certain Japanese games, even, you know, even though it's set in Japan, I feel like the theme and like what they're trying to talk about story wise is can go beyond japan and, yeah. and so i think that's really important to make like a global game even though it is very japanese like obviously mm. it's still popular uh worldwide so i think that was uh that was smart as well Absolutely. and I, I and i wonder too if they did this on purpose like there's a moment in the game where you go to hawaii and yeah. so i wonder which you know i, I think that's probably common because it's close to japan but i wonder if mm. that was also another attempt to like let's bring in more of a global audience by going to uh america for a little bit 
They do like doing that. Yeah, I've, I've noticed they, they like to kind of expand the horizon slowly so that people can um, associate and, and relate to some of the characters and some of the experiences. And I think that that must have purposely been set there. I think nearly everything they've put in that game was purposely set there because mm. it just feels like there was a lot of thought process behind how you kind of progress through the story, where you go, how the characters develop. I think they knew that when they were in creation of that game, the story and the characters, they knew they had something. They knew they had something big. So they went all out to, you know, give you that total experience. Yeah, and, and I feel like, I think they knew, like you were saying, I think they knew they had something because the game got delayed so many times. Like, I don't mm, know if you remember this, true. but when, <laughs> it's like a meme at this point. But when they initially had that, just that teaser image of the red background with the chairs and the ball and chain it said winter 2014 <laughs> and the game didn't end up coming out until fall 2016 in japan and like spring 2017 in america yeah. or in the west so I, I i think they're like oh okay we need to like really put more into this game because this is going to be special so yeah I, I agree with you absolutely and they, they did it right as well right they were pretty transparent with delays and what was happening and they, they stayed true to the kind of initial vision whereas a failed version of it is do you remember final fantasy 13 uh versus versus 13 oh man yeah that was a whole saga yeah that uh <laughs> what was really sad about that is like when they re-revealed the game as 15 they mm -hmm. had that trailer yeah. and a lot of that didn't even end up making it in the uh in the full game or at least not in the same way so i yeah. i felt like they were stuck i felt bad for that whole team because they i felt like they were stuck trying to shoehorn in what already existed into into this new game so yeah that was kind of a bummer situation i i know and and the biggest disappointment for me was i i was really looking forward to when the initial trailer for versus 13 came out right that that character stella and then how mm. somehow she could summon those those weapons and the kind of love hate romeo juliet love attacking rivalry love again whatever i thought that dynamic would have been so cool and then she got turned into is it, is it luna luna freya or something yeah who's just the summoner who doesn't really she's know, barely in the game fun. Yeah, she did. yeah. What a missed opportunity. I, I wonder why why they went and did that. I heard something like the main designer said Stella wasn't that attractive. And I was like, hmm. what are you talking about? That was the main selling point for me. <laughs> yeah, and then they also like went, I feel like they went way overboard doing like the cross media stuff. Like they had the movie and the anime oh, yeah. and stuff. And like, I actually watched the movie mm. and I was shocked at the stuff they put in the movie and left out of the game oh, i'm like why yeah. wasn't that in the game <laughs> uh and like you know you're talking about like early versus 13 footage because like mm. the way 15 starts is you like your car's dead and you're pushing a car like very exciting <laughs> right yeah. but in the original from what i understand the original versus 13 the way the game started was your city was being invaded so you had to like escape this giant invasion and then escape in your car and i'm like that would have been a way more exciting way to kick the game yeah. off right because then you know like oh you know things are happening your whole city your whole life is getting upended and you have to barely escape and and then now it's all about like you know recovering the crystal yeah yeah now it's about <laughs> pushing a card not very exciting <laughs> Yeah, that, that's totally true, because isn't that like one of the success factors of Final Fantasy VII? The fact that you're on that bombing mission straight away, mm. right out of the gate, you know, that is, wow, what's going on here? Epic, things are happening all over the place. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Like, that's a that's an opening that I reference a lot in, in my videos is like, mm. you get, get going right away. Like, I, I feel like... Um, not a, a Japanese game, but I think Naughty Dog's really good at that. Like they'll do these mm. like flash forwards to like a later in the game and then they'll flash back to something a little less exciting. And I think Persona 5 did that where it's like, hey, we're in the middle of the heist, but then we'll go back and start from the beginning type of thing. Um, but I think 7 has did it brilliantly where it's just like, hey, hopping off a train, getting right into the action, right into the story. And I'm not sure why more games don't do that. I don't, I, don't, I feel like they have to... They feel this need to over tutorialize everything. Oh, you're you know? right. Handhold you, kind of beginner, new friendly. You're in the city, and your your little villagers are telling you how to do stuff. <laughs> and I, I, I think, I think Elden Ring proved that people don't need that because, like, that game sold incredibly well, and like, you can miss, you can totally miss the tutorial, like I did. <laughs> I just happened to know how the the game played, you know, from other Dark Souls games and whatever. But like. I think developers way over way un underestimate gamers intelligence. So mm. I'm hoping going forward that uh, thanks to Elden Ring, maybe there'll be a little more 
less handholdy and just be like, hey, you you know what you're doing. Straight into the action. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. And also, I, I'm quite a fan of the kind of shock factor where something big happens, but you don't fully understand it. You can't fully explain it. It's like referencing Sukuden 2 again. Right at the beginning, you know, you're part of the... Without spoilers, I'm sure everyone's played it by now, but the Unicorn <laughs> Brigade, you're part of your, you know, little crew in Highland, and then your your whole Unicorn Brigade gets slaughtered. All your children, your recruitees get killed and you get pushed up the cliff. And you're like, what just happened? <laughs> that's the start of the game. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, that's another great a great kickoff. Yeah, because like you said, it you don't expect it to be that shocking. So mm. <laughs> for, it, for it to be that shocking is uh, is brave. And I, I just, I hope more games do that. Yeah, and, and back in the day, like, do you think they have more kind of creative freedom? Because I'm just remembering a game called Vandal Hearts. Did you ever play Vandal Hearts? I know of it. I've never played it myself. Is that the like the turn-based strategy type game? Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. Where the so blood very... sprays everywhere. <laughs> that's the one, that's the one. So like the first chop, right? They're teaching you how to attack. And when you attack, attack. <laughs> and after the guys of blood flies out, and you're like, okay, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> I know, it almost reminds me of like Kill Bill or something like that. Like they're just intentionally going way over the top. Yeah. And and speaking of way over the top, these kind of strategy, kind of tactical turn based, um, you know, um, moving across the platform, there's always that one or two hidden ability that it just breaks the game completely. Because I remember in Vandal Hearts, if you unlock like the secret class, you've got a spell which targets the whole map. So you can literally stand at your starting block and just, just destroy everyone with <laughs> one spell. It's But that's, I guess, a bonus quest, isn't it? The kind of secret... Uh, Secret buffs. Well, it's funny that you say that because there's a class in um, Final Fantasy Tactics called a calculator that can mm, do something oh, similar, but it, it's, again, it's based on math or whatever. And I, I've never done this, but I've seen videos where a, somebody will start a map and then the calculator will do some move and then they mm. just wipe the board in one turn. Same type of deal. <laughs> so, no, I, there it's, it's definitely out there if you know how to exploit it. <laughs> that's true. That's very true. And speaking of those kind of crazy mechanics, did you ever play this Gaia? I've played quite a few Disgaea games. Like that's a game, that's a series that is a little disappointing to me. In in that it doesn't seem to make drastic leaps from game to game. It makes very More tiny play. incremental mm -hmm. improvements, and they don't, you know, they don't seem too uh, intent on like making it like dramatically better with each game. And I, I understand Nippon Ichi is kind of a smaller studio, and so they probably don't have the budget for that, but. It's a, it, to me, they, they're starting to get stale. Um, mm. Like, if you've played one, you've played them all. Like, oh, you know, it's wacky and you're doing a million damage and all this stuff. I'm like, okay, that's cool for a couple games. But now let's, let's do something new here, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's the kind of thing. Like, this is where it's really interesting for me. Because a series like Pokemon, they know the winning formula. So they kind of can't reinvent the wheel, but they try to add shiny additions on top of it. But people go mad, you know, for Pokemon, obviously, you know, biggest franchise in the kind of world. Everyone knows about Pokemon. Everyone gets the newest games. But then you've got like this Gaia where they're just introducing new characters and a new world, but following the same kind of story, same kind of script, comedy value, over the top numbers and whatnot. And I think they've got a kind of super niche fan base you know people who love it absolutely love it people who don't love it so much they're like oh, i've played one i've played them all kind of thing why is there the different perceptions between you know someone successfully recreating the formula and then another company just looking stale and outdated that's a good question um i i think there's I, I think like you were, I think you made a good point where right? like I think Pokemon is much more uh, wide appeal casual and mm -hmm. this guy is definitely much more of a hardcore fan base and I think the hardcore Pokemon um, players definitely get upset game after game like oh mm -hmm. why aren't we improving why do the you know why does it still run and look bad you know they have all the money in the world this could be the best looking game if they wanted it to be blah 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 so I, I think there definitely is there are people that complain about Pokemon. Um, and I think there are people that I just think this guy is a smaller franchise. So you probably yeah. just aren't going to hear about that. And they haven't, sure. you know, they have a formula that some people like, but it's not on the scale of even something in its own genre, like fire emblem. Like I think fire emblem for better or worse. I think their winning formula is like the waifus and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> like, like, obviously awakening was really good but then like they had the relationship stuff and then like i feel like with each subsequent game they've just leaned harder and harder and harder into that stuff which is fine i mean if it, if it works for you then like hey you know good for you but um absolutely 
Yeah, yeah. I, hear you. I I completely agree with that. And I guess you know, in terms of personal preferences, the the gaming community is 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 wild. There's so many aspects to it. What would you say is the best aspects of the kind of gamers, the pro gamers, the gaming community, the discussion forums, the things that you see on YouTube? And what is the worst aspects of of the gaming community that you'd like? Shudder, or oh, the dark side of games. Oh <laughs> man, um, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think, I think if you find smaller communities, like either on Discord or you know, different YouTube channels, and like you have a good person running it, like you can get some really good discussions going and have it be civil and not be like a disaster. Mm. I feel like those are unfortunately rare because of like the anonymous aspect of being on the internet you can just make up a name put out what, whatever avatar oh, yeah. and you can just say whatever garbage that warriors yeah. yeah exactly so I, I think those do exist it just it takes a, a really strong community leader to kind of wrangle that sure. but man the <clears throat> the on the opposite side i just feel like people take stuff that doesn't matter and just run a million miles an hour with it so like here's here's a good example and i'm you know i'll probably get canceled for this but whatever but like right now the, the big hot topic is that harry potter the new hogwarts harry potter oh, game man. and there's a lot of controversy with what jk rowling has said and in fact <clears throat> i read it this morning or last night one of the bigger gaming forums reset era or reset era or however you say that oh yes they, to the way, yes. <clears throat> they totally banned discussion of that game entirely on the forum really? Yeah, and I'm like, that's ridiculous. And because of KK Rowling. Yes, because of that. Yeah, oh. they don't even want to. They're they're it's like crazy. super woke over there. They like yeah. they won't allow any type of discussion that's mildly controversial. And you know, a lot of people um, from Reset Era came from another forum. I don't know if you remember NeoGaf back yes, in the day. And I got to be honest, like, I know the, the guy that ran that forum came into some controversy, but like the discussion on NeoGAF was incredible. Like mm -hmm. people were actually saying whatever they wanted. You know, you would get banned if you said something really stupid, but like yeah. there was like good, genuine conversation. They wouldn't ban words. They wouldn't ban games. They wouldn't ban people because mm -hmm. of stupid stuff. So in a lot of ways, I really miss NeoGAF. Like it's still around, but it's like a shell of its former of self. And like developers would come on there and creators would come on there. It was just such a yeah. good like genuine Up. place yeah. yeah totally and i just i'm so sad that that it's not what it used to be i wish that they, that could come back in a big way um but yeah i think the anonymity of of the internet has ruined it and i think people are just a little overly sensitive and this is coming from someone who grew up in the bay area that is sort of like woke central if you will right <laughs> so like I, I, but i've i don't know i just feel like the conversation is always there's always much more nuance to everything than people want to want to say like people just want to reduce it down to like the you know the simplest essence of of a point but it's right. never that simple it's never that it's simple. true that's completely true do you remember a forum called game faqs or game facts oh yeah sure yeah yeah that so yeah it used to be hot and really cool back in the day many different interesting kind of channels and topics that you can talk about and then i think what really killed that kind of um message board was people were making alt accounts and really being toxic and trolly and flaming and backing their own opinions and then you get someone who's like you know being obsessively like over the top annoying and just chasing away all the good kind of posters and i just remember like do you remember a topic called Ultimessia is Renoa? <laughs> what? No, I don't know. <laughs> so somebody writ a massive, massive theory how Renoa is actually Ultimessia, but from the future. So Renoa, she's a witch. She lives a long time. Squalls passed away, whatever. She gets depressed and she's got that mage ability. She is Ultimessia and she goes back in time to try to <laughs> undo everything. And there's time compression. It's, it's amazing kind of theory theory that's that people put out there <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> and, fun you know, to think about but <laughs> yeah yeah you know people come up with this kind of stuff and what i'm really kind of fascinated by is every game no matter how in-depth you think of the plot the storyline there's always loopholes and there's always like mm. how's that possible or what really happened on that scene or at that moment right and eventually you know kind of sequels might fill in the gaps or answer some of the questions but do you ever think like the game creators game developers hang out on these forums listen to these wacky ideas and wacky theories and like that's really cool i'm gonna make that a reality that's gonna be the that is the one. <laughs> oh, for sure and i I'd like to think so. I think there are some developers more than others that 
purposefully leave stuff unexplained for theories mm. and like um like i think dark soul that whole series like people love that because it's more lore based than like here's yeah. a story so i think people fill in the gap and people make really fun <clears throat> lore videos and this is not you know japanese game related but i think one of the more infamous ones was uh five nights at freddy's okay. uh like there's these there's a big channel called uh the game theorists i think is what mm. it's called and they have tons and tons of videos about like trying to figure out what the story behind five nights at freddy is and where the <laughs> monsters came from and where the person that works there came from i mean it's it's yeah. crazy for a game that's like pretty simple it's just about opening and closing doors at the end of the day but like they managed to like pull all this lore out and i think the um the creator just ran with it i mean they have so mm. many of those games now so i think that's probably the best example i can think of yeah yeah i i hear that that's that's a really kind of genius way to kind of immerse yourself in in that community get the feedback on your creation on your on your baby if you were and kind of evolve it with the kind of thoughts of the community it's kind of like what if they are posting on the forums to kind of lead the herd lead the masses in a certain ah, direction no that's, that's <laughs> interesting like yeah making like an alt account so people don't know yeah that's that that would be really smart actually <laughs> <laughs> subliminal marketing <laughs> that's right <laughs> that would be really cool yeah and is there like any game that you when you first played it you're like meh not that interested not that engaged but you gave it another chance and were like actually there's some depth here i i kind of see what the hype is about and really became a fan over time on on subsequent playthroughs oh that's a good question i feel like there's probably there's got to be something out there i mean in, weirdly enough I, in some ways i would say final fantasy 7 just because at the time i hadn't really played a game like that so I, again, it was mostly like sports games or like Crash Bandicoot or Tony Hawk oh, or yeah, something. Yeah. And uh, I remember I was watching my friend play it. I'm like, oh, they have like square hands. Like, this is really weird. What is this? <laughs> but then he let me borrow it because he was like on he either beat the game or was on like the next disc or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is actually kind of interesting. Um, mm. I'm trying to think of other games. Um, not not exactly the same game per se but like i played uh trails of cold steel and wasn't a okay. huge fan of that formula although i should love it because it's kind of like persona but to me the pacing is just way slower yes. but i played um uh trails from zero which is an older game and i like mm -hmm. that a lot so i don't know if it, it has something to do with you know kind of like we were talking about earlier like just getting the game going right away instead of this just ridiculously yes, slow build up, build up. Mm -hmm. like i feel like cold steel takes like a dozen hours to get going whereas <laughs> with yeah. trails from zero like you have your whole party at the very beginning of the game like hey your police squad here's your thing like just get going so um yeah and i guess i don't know if that counts but that's that would kind of be another example yeah no of course of course actually it's funny you mentioned that i've got your trails from zero was worth the long wait video up right now on a, on a different screen <laughs> oh nice <laughs> yeah because like i haven't actually played a trails from from a game before but i was talking to a big anime youtube creator and he's a big fan of the series but there's so many different games and i kind of mm. feel as though you need to um either play the previous ones because there is some connectivity between the games or watch someone do a let's play and run through you know so you kind of got the backstory um just it's an investment in time and i guess it's one of those games once you play it you get hooked right you can't drop it the story is good it becomes really interesting and you want to play the next game and the next game so is that a big commitment is that the kind of game where you need that time to really sit down and enjoy it yeah it, it depends on how invested you want to get right because like <clears throat> I think it all builds to Cold Steel because like it starts with Sky and then it was like um, Trails from Zero, which that was the order of release, but we didn't get it until like literally last year. But I think those games came out like a decade ago. Um, and but in Cold Steel, it like brings all those characters in and that like, kind of builds up. And then there's like there's another game coming out this year called um, Trails into Reverie, which is like mm. an epilogue to all those games. So I guess it depends on how invested you want to get. <laughs> 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 sure yeah i hear you i hear you and just going back to the kind of youtube track then so did you always know that you wanted to do the kind of rpg and game kind of reviews and you know the highlights of the new games coming out and build a kind of community around gaming was that always the intention from the very start no so i actually have another channel that a lot of people don't know about um where i would i started doing like uh like old cartoon reviews um yeah. But because like my thought at the time, this was like very inspired by um, like the angry video game nerd. This was like the right. early, early days of YouTube. And I'm like, OK, well, he's doing video games. Let me do cartoons. And um, as we all know, the the copyright 
uh, you know, squad didn't like that because I had a lot of footage from <laughs> from cartoons. Sure. And eventually, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> like I just kept running into so many issues. I was like, I can't keep doing this because I'm going to I just won't be able to keep the videos up. Sure. And um, that happened to coincide when I uh, kind of fell back in love with JRPGs because it was funny. I actually just made a video on my Patreon for this recently. But so it was that. And then I was big into World of Warcraft. But when mm -hmm. I moved to South Korea, they banned my account because like one day I was in California and then the oh, next seven, day I was in yeah. South Korea. They're like, oh, this is something shady is going on. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, well, crap. Now what do I do? And so um, I had my PSP and I was just digging up all these old JRPGs. I'm like, oh, these are really cool. And so from there, that kind of just turned into uh, like, oh, well, let's start talking about this. And it was mm -hmm. it wasn't always RPG stuff. Like if you go way back on my channel, it was more of like a news. I was just doing okay. gaming news. Yeah, but yeah. eventually I just that's those are the games I like the most. So eventually it became more about um, RPG stuff. Of course, of course. And naturally, if you're passionate about something, you can tell, you know, the, how you portray it, the kind of quality of the content, how you deliver it. I think you can really kind of tell in the way that you present those kind of things. Like one of the ones I was watching was that, was it Sakura Wars? Sakura Wars that you did? Oh, a, yeah, a yeah. Oh, I love goodness, that game. Man. That game's fun. <laughs> I, I fell in love with, with that, um, the concept of that just by watching your video earlier today because, um, funnily enough, because I collect a lot of figurines, I bought that Sakura figurine, a really beautiful mm. one seven scale release one. And then I became invested in the series after buying the figure. I was like, whoa, what this, what's this character from Sakura Wars? Let's look into that. And then there's a really old school animation, which I've, I've only watched like two or three episodes, but the game, I saw the game footage from your, your channel and that game looks top. It looks really fun. That's above everything. It looks fun. Would you say it's a, a worthwhile commitment? Yeah, no, I I argue all the time that it's like one of the most underrated RPGs mm. like on uh, you know uh, on PS4. I'm really I'm sad that they never ported it to other consoles like on yeah. like on PC or even Switch. Like I feel like that would give it, you know, a second life because it's sure. definitely like a niche game, right? Cuz it's essentially like a dating sim visual novel and then there's yeah. there's like an action component where you're in those mechs and stuff like that yeah. but to me like i feel like if you like persona you'll probably really like this game because it's it, i mean it's not as involved with like the life sim stuff but like you know you're like you'll go to you'll do combat and then you have like you're running this theater weirdly enough and then you get a chance yeah, yeah. to talk to your all the girls that run it and there's all these little side events that you can get involved in i don't know i just thought it was I just fell in love with those characters, like the, that main cast, all the female characters that are on your team. I just thought it was really neat. And it's also got um, like, I know it's not called Power Rangers in Japan, but it's got a lot of Power Ranger vibes to me where everybody's got their Hentai. Hentai, super yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. Like when you get in your mechs, like you all have, you know, your colored outfits and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. So sure, um, sure. anybody that grew up with Power Rangers, I feel like would really um, would really dig, dig that. Sure. And, and then the music, like I, I play that main theme song in a lot of my <laughs> videos. I just love that main theme song. It's just so fun and upbeat. And yeah, there's there's just so much about that game that um, that just jived with me yeah. specifically. But uh, yeah, that's that's a really fantastic game. That if, if you guys haven't played it out there, I would definitely give it a try. It's probably cheap now, too. Isn't, isn't that a good call, though? Like, a lot of the music from these kind of niche series and older games, they won't get copyright striked because nobody cares. <laughs> they just, you just chuck them on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, speaking of which, there's... um. Do you know of a game called Dragon Force? Dragon Force. I know the band Dragon Force. Uh, <laughs> that always comes up. When you type in Dragon Force, it always comes up. There's, there's a Sega Saturn game, I think, released in Japan, and that has some badass RPG style music. I throw that into so many of my, my videos because just for the feels. <laughs> I've heard, I actually heard the, of the game too, though, but I just never owned a Sega Saturn, so that mm. game just totally missed me. But uh, it's like, what kind of what kind of RPG is it? So it's kind of... Well, I've never played it really, but I've I've seen seen the um, the clips of it just from looking up the music. Um, you kind of take charge of different armies. You're allied with different armies, and you play a different storyline depending on which army you go with. So you're either with the elves protecting the forest or the empire fight, you know, fighting against rebellion and infighting and whatnot. But the music is really really thematic. So the elven music RPG is such a sweet lullaby. You've got the kind of badass knight who's stopping the infighting in her castle and it's this kind of black knight and then i was really surprised because underneath the black knight armor was this really long haired blonde beautiful girl and you wouldn't expect that that must have been the twist in the game who knows but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, 
Yeah. It kind of reminds me of like Metroid, right? Like when the game ends, like, oh, Metroid, oh, it's Samus with a girl, <laughs> yeah. what? <laughs> She's a hot chick. She'd been yeah. rolling around, dropping mines and blowing shit up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's that kind of feeling. And, oh, you didn't play the Sega Saturn. That means, did you ever play a game called Guardian Heroes? Do you know Guardian Heroes? Um, That sounds familiar. I feel like that game got ported and was on like uh, arcades and stuff that's like kind of like a beat-em-up style game right yeah it's a side-scrolling beat-em-up with kind of free lanes but the really good thing about that kind of game was you've got such a wide cast of characters and it was the first game that i ever played that you could control as a playable character nearly all the enemies and all the monsters in the game so they were all playable characters and it's like a massive battle arena so you could have eight characters in a beat-em-up style, fighting against it, it was just chaos, but in an animated style. <laughs> I, I like that game a lot. I use the music from that game too. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah, that's cool, that's cool. If someone started a, a YouTube channel tomorrow and they wanted to go into RPG reviews and I think Let's Plays is oversaturated, but let's say reviewing RPGs and games and, and upcoming games as well, what would be your advice for making themselves stand out and giving themselves a chance to kind of succeed in YouTube? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. I, I in a lot of ways, I feel like even uh, doing reviews is saturated. Mm. I, I find it challenging at times too. Mm. Like I know I have a a bigger channel or a channel that people would say would be big. They'd be thrilled to have a channel my size. And mm -hmm. even for me, I find it challenging because like the tricky part is uh, like for me, if I don't get an early review code and I'm not there on embargo day with ev with everybody else, then yeah. people got their fix and they're like, well, I watched the IGN's review. I don't need to watch your review. Oh, so yeah. it's, mm -hmm. so my advice would be to, you, you need to either pick, you need to find something that either nobody's doing or do it way better than everybody okay. else. So like th this was hilarious and super creative and super fun. So I have a friend, Alex, their channel's called um, Backlog Battle and they- Oh yes, I'm aware of him, yeah. Yeah, and they put out, so yesterday was all the, the latest Neptunia game came out, and so all the reviews came out for that, and they really didn't like the game. And so instead of just, like, you know, dumping on the game, what they did is they presented the the situation like a date, right? So the, the, mm -hmm. the, the review starts where, like, they're in this fancy restaurant, and they're like, yeah, you know, I, I feel like it's just not really working out. And then, and then it cuts from Alex, and then the cutaway is to, like, a bo the box of the game. <laughs> Because it's like totally unexpected. You're like, what's happening? And then you're like, you know, we've been on this date for, and then it cuts to the clock, in-game clock, and it's like, it says 45 minutes or whatever. It's like, we've been here for about 45 minutes. I just thought that was a really creative way to sure. to do a review that I've never really seen before. So if my advice would be do something different, be like extra creative, or if mm. you have to be better than everybody else, or, you know, um, pick you have to either really niche down or pick something that like people aren't really talking about. Cause e like I said, even that our space is getting a little saturated um, yeah. just because, and, and here's the honest truth. You were talking about let's plays. I feel like let's plays are saturated because they're so easy to do, right? Like, okay, let cool. me just record, turn my mic on easy. So everybody can do it, which means everybody can do it. So everybody's cool. doing it. And so the, the there's there's a quality gap right like you need to be of better course. than everybody else so like same thing with videos like reviews or retrospectives or whatever you want to do like you you just have to do something unique or just be better than everybody else absolutely absolutely and on that kind of point as well so this um this was my kind of mindset going into it because you see all these kind of youtube gurus right all these channels telling you about how to succeed and the algorithm and, and whatnot but ultimately if you want to stand out the most unique factor that you can have is yourself. So mm. if you're kind of presentable, you get people to be a fan of you, your delivery, the way you edit, the way you present yourself. Like you mentioned Alex, right? He immerses himself into that review. No one else can do that because that's him and his ideas and how he interacts with the character. So if you can get people to become a fan of you as opposed to just that popular game or something like that, then that's the kind of long-term fan that you can kind of build a community and a relationship uh, kind of with. And I feel that like a lot of people starting up YouTube, they're a little bit kind of shy to be themselves. They just want mm. to present themselves in a certain way that they imagine that people will accept. But it's much easier. Like this kind of conversation, you know, me and you can just naturally flow, naturally talk, got that chemistry. Um, isn't it just easier to be yourself, but be the best version of yourself that people can see? Does that kind of make sense? <laughs> oh, no, totally. And, and I, I, that's a that's a great point because I think people are fairly like, oh people aren't going to like me they are going to think I'm ugly or I talk mm. weird or whatever but I think ultimately that's what people 
get attached to at the end of the day like uh, again if you look back on my channel I, I had some on camera stuff but then when i started doing reviews i tried to do this sort of like visual novel thing where i had like somebody draw like an anime avatar and i had like a text box and it was all the text would come up like a visual oh, yeah, novel yeah. <laughs> and and i even tried to do like this weird anime voice that didn't really work so <laughs> but eventually i was like this is too much trouble and whatever i'm just gonna do my normal voice so sure. um yeah i would say yeah being yourself it, it's everybody says it and it sounds stupid but it's i mean it's just true it just is Absolutely, absolutely. Like, I think the biggest um, pit hole that people can get into, especially new creators, is that effort and time into something doesn't necessarily result, correspond to the kind of output. So some people, like, put massive effort into this one video and there's mm. no kind of uptake on it, no impressions, no engagement. And they're like, why? I did everything right. I listened to all the piece of advice. But I, I don't think that's the, the way it works. It's more about just kind of being consistent and creating the kind of content that you want to create and that you think people enjoy and kind of organically growing that way because it's the same as business, really. There's no magic trick to it and you're not relying on luck. You're trying to actually... It's like your online kind of diary, really, right? You can see your journey, you can see your experiences, how mm -hmm. you've grown over time, the, the kind of, especially for your perspective, the games that you've played and your feelings of the games at that time. Isn't it like really cool to have a kind of online library that you call your own? No, it, it definitely is. It's fun, like, if you just scroll through like somebody's channel or even mine, like you can see like the evolution of like, even just the thumbnails and like how that has changed over time and how that, you know, how that differentiates and, Real quick, one point you're talking about like, oh, I put all this effort into a video and nobody cares. I think the the title and thumbnail are equally as important as the video itself because if yeah. the title and thumbnail isn't interesting and they don't click, then it doesn't matter how good your video is. Exactly. So I think that's I think that's one thing that people like I think they think of that last and I've almost flipped it. I almost think like, okay, here's kind of what I want to talk about. Let me see if I can come up with a title and thumbnail that's compelling and then do the video from there just because it makes it easier than trying to shoehorn a title or thumbnail mm. in after the fact because then you're stuck you're like whatever i made in that video is what i have to work with so that would be another piece of advice i would give people is try 100%. to think of a title thumbnail first you're right you're right because it's like that old kind of haiku if a tree falls somewhere and do you hear it well if you don't see the thing you don't know whether it's good or not nobody even is mm. aware that it exists right and nobody's aware it exists it doesn't matter how good it is it doesn't mean anything you got to actually have someone physically watching it to have even a chance to create them into a kind of long-term fan or subscriber or whatnot so you're right that thumbnail is the first thing that kind of hooks you onto it and then that title if it's interesting gets them onto it and if your content is good then there you go it sells itself doesn't it yeah no totally i mean that's kind of um i, I think that's why mr we have people always talk about mr beast i mean i think that's why he's so successful is he he does that approach and he spends like a ridiculous amount of time on titles yeah. and thumbnails and like again I, I could go all day about youtube stuff i love talking about this stuff too but like one thing i'll do is um i'll take my thumbnail and i'll like shrink it and then i'll open up the youtube homepage and just kind of toss it on top of another oh, thumbnail yeah, yeah. and be like okay does it stand out and if it doesn't stand out why uh -huh. what can i adjust so like that's kind of a a little pro tip um just to just to make sure that your your video does stand out because for me that's where most i would say the vast majority of my traffic comes from is people on the home page it's not subscribers it's not search it's just mm. hey i'm i'm opening youtube what what does youtube want to show me today yes and in so, feed in feed kind of direction to your your videos and that's a really good point because the type of person that you're trying to attract is yourself so you can be your own best judge on would i click that is that interesting to me and that's that's really good and actually another tip that i learned from um another big channel was um especially in the figure kind of realm uh he learned that if you were too specific so you say for example queen's blade figure one seven scale twenty thousand yen you're only going to attract one like specific type of person but if you're very generic like this figure is the figure of the year or this figure i can't believe they did this right it's like wow intrigue it creates that intrigue right and like what are they talking about let's open it up and let's have a look mm -hmm. whereas if you tell everything from the beginning and you're very specific they're like oh, okay it's that one figure mm, maybe not <laughs> so <laughs> yeah no that i mean that's a that's a great piece of advice that's that's great feedback because like and you know i think people too are are too afraid that they're being clickbaity or something mm. but like if you're delivering on whatever you're yeah. talking about i think it's totally fine like uh, like one thing I did not too long ago, so that there's a One Piece RPG that just came out, and in one of the oh, videos, yes. right. looks good. 
Yeah, yeah no, it, it's solid, especially if you're a One Piece fan. I think mm. I think One Piece fans will really dig it. And so I had this video that I put out. It was like a preview, and it wasn't doing very well. And I'm like, do I want to put Robin in the thumbnail? Because she's very... Uh, busty let's say and so yeah, i'm like ah, whatever <laughs> we're doing it and then you know view shot up i'm like well you know maybe a little clickbaity but if if at the end of the day it, it it gets views and i still delivered on the promise of the title and the thumbnail then i'm i'm okay with it absolutely and here's something i've never tried before right so i've actually read around that if you change the thumbnail and if you changed the title youtube might give your video and other lease of life in terms of natural impressions so what if you rotated through all of the one piece girls nami robin well hancock do do you think that <laughs> you, could, you could recycle that video over and over in front of people's homepage, and uh, it might get another lease of life oh no i mean i've done that countless times it totally works like yeah. I, I think that's for people that are like oh i made a thumbnail and i don't i don't i can't change it like no change it as many times mm. as you need to because youtube gives you real time stats so if you like you change it like let me come back in an hour and see if the views per hour have gone up like do i do it all day long like there's a tool (laughs) i use uh called tubebuddy and what it does is really helpful like it lets every day it'll swap the thumbnail and then and then it tells you after like i mean you could set any amount of time but i I try to do like maybe 10 days or so it'll tell you which video got more clicks or what you know the different statistics and stuff so um, but if, if I have a video that's like bombing out of the gate, I'm like, Ooh, okay, let's change this now. So I can see, cause like, yeah, sometimes, uh, I, you get the title thumbnail wrong. Like I have this video on my channel called like 10 JRPG secrets or something. Yeah. And I think I went through, man, I must've gone through 10 thumbnails until I finally settled on one that people liked. So mm. if, yeah, if you have a video that you believe in and you, and it's not doing well, like don't give up on it. Keep changing the title, keep changing the thumbnail. Cause like there, it's not like YouTube's like, Oh, they changed the title. Nope. Stop showing it to people. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. And I guess from a man of experience, let, let's put a number on this for, for the viewing audience. So what would you say in terms of click through rate? What number is, is a bombed thumbnail and title and what number would you accept? So it's totally going to vary because like depending on channel size right like so if you have a bigger channel mm. your click through rate may inevitably be lower because it's sure. getting shown to Big more audience. people yes but on the opposite side if you have a smaller channel you're probably going to get like a insane click through rate because just not that many people I'm are so. getting <laughs> shown to so just but for me just to give you an example like if my thumbnail on day one has like or if my video has like a let's say a 15% click through rate. Like that's amazing. That, that thing's going to the moon. Yes. So like 10 to 15% is like really good for me. Like five is horrible. Like I had a, that Neptunia video I put out yesterday. I think it has like a 5% click through rate and the views are just way down, but that, you know, 5% could be good for somebody. So, Mm. um, and then on the opposite 15 could be bad. So it, it, it really depends. So you kind of just have to monitor your <clears throat> your analytics. But um, according to YouTube, they say the average click-through rate is between 2 and 10%, which is not super helpful, <laughs> I, I don't think. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, too wide-ranging. Yeah, yeah too so I think it's going to vary depending on your channel. So That makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. And for someone who has aspirations, let's say, to, to become a full-time YouTuber, full-time content creator, what is the metric that they need to aim for? Is it a subscriber count or is an average view count what is that top line figure that they need to do to say okay i'm gonna live my life year on year as a youtube creator content creator i gotta be honest i don't i almost don't think the views matter it's it's more comes down to how you monetize your channel because Mm. their channels way smaller than mine that have like a massive patreon page and their views are like a fraction of mine but they have such a dedicated patreon community that they can just support the creator that way or like Amazon affiliate links or whatever it is. Yes. Cause I think, I think a lot of people just think, Oh, it's got to come from views. And the weird Not thing AdSense, about, yeah. yeah, the weird thing about AdSense is depending on what your niche is, it can, you know, vary wildly. Like I, I get pretty good views, like monthly amount of views. But like, if I had a tech channel or a business channel, I'd be like a millionaire, but because, oh, yeah. it's, because it's gaming, <laughs> it's just, it's not, it just doesn't bring as many CPM, CPM. I believe is the metric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The CPM is just way lower for gaming, or at least on my channel it is. So that would be my metric. Like 
if you feel like you have like you're bringing in enough revenue however you can do it that's more the metric than than um than subscribers or, or viewers because again there's even channels that are way bigger than mine mm. subscriber wise but they don't get as many views as i do so it it i think it comes down to how how you can monetize it and if you're really thinking about it you, you have to I would always say to diversify, don't just rely on just on AdSense or just on Patreon. Like there's sponsorships, there's affiliate sure. links, there's merch. Um, you could offer courses or, uh, you know, whatever. There's a variety of things that you could offer to monetize it. So to me, that would be my metric is can you make enough to pay the bills <laughs> that's fantastic that is the golden piece of advice there right you have to commercialize your it's a business prospect at the end of the day in a self-sustenance you've got to make sure that you can meet make ends meet you earn yeah. enough and that your effort is rewarded you know correlates more the harder you work the more content you create the more income that comes in so yeah that's exactly the, the answer I, I wanted to hear from from a man who knows himself so i'm, <laughs> I'm very glad that uh, uh you know we're on the kind of safe wavelength there and yeah as a thank you for coming on the show i've got a whole bunch of goodies uh lined up um it's gonna probably take hours upon hours to show you everything but i will offline show you lots and lots of the the merch because i've just grabbed a, a war scroll here so i have maybe um a little inside secret maybe about 300 or 400 of these kind of things so, like, oh, nice. As Bell Lance. Very and, uh, cool. The man with the too. buckles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm loving, I'm loving all of the. Um, I think I've just grabbed the Tails bucket here because I put them all in buckets. So now they're kind of Tails. Oh, Zillia 2. Oh, that's yep, such a beautiful yep. cover. I love that art. It's, it's really, yeah, this kind of stuff is glowing. And let me see if I can. I'm going to edit this out because it might take a little while for me to find exactly what I'm looking for here. But uh, this one, this one will do. Okay. I have merch upon merch beyond people's wildest dreams, but you'll instantly recognize this. What is this? When it goes to the main thing? I'm trying to think of what this is from. It sounds, it sounds familiar. I can't put my finger on it though. You're gonna kick yourself if you can't get this. <laughs> I know. I wonder if it's because it's the music box type of thing. Yeah. Oh man, help me out. What is, what is it? This is from... Fire Emblem Free Houses opening theme. Oh wow. Okay. Wow. Now I can hear. It. <laughs> <laughs> yes, wow. I've been collecting so many. Oh, you'll you'll recognize this one. This one for sure. <clears throat> these are some of the little um because my daughter's only seven months old. She really appreciates these kind of simple tunes. Um, but you'll you'll know this one. Oh, the other one's playing in the background. That's not helpful. <laughs> oh my god. Can I, can I see it on camera? How? Eight, eight heroes. Oh, that's Octopath Traveler, right? Yeah, because I'm like... Octopath Traveler opening, yes. That exactly. one got... That one got me because even with Octopath Traveler 2, they opened the trailer with like a very like calming piano rendition of that. I'm like, what is they this? Did. I know what this is. And I'm like, oh, yes, it's Octopath. That's it. That's it. And, <clears throat> and you know, obviously living in Japan, the, the world of merch and options, they know how to absolutely strip oh your God. wallet bare <laughs> everywhere you go, man. It's uh, something you, you're obsessed with and you actually the little you gotcha the, you... capsules or whatever they're called. Yeah, the gacha, the gacha capsules, the gacha mm -hmm. capsules, aisles and aisles of merch beyond your kind of wildest dreams. Um, did you ever watch any of the Gundam series? I watched Gundam Wing back in the day, but that was about it. Gundam yeah. Wing. <clears throat> that's, that's my childhood right there. I do have some Gundam Wing music boxes. Do you remember Just Communication, the opening song? Dun, 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 dun. If I heard it, I don't, I, it's been a long time, but if I heard it, I'd probably be like, oh yeah, that's Gundam Wing. <laughs> Gundam Wing. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's, thank you for coming onto the podcast. I always give my guests um, a prize of your choosing. So I will show you some of the merch you choose the one you want. And it's, it's coming your way, Taylor. So thank you for your time. Oh, well, appreciate it, man. Thank you. That's very nice. Absolutely. Here. Cool, cool. No, I hope you enjoyed your time. No, no, it was fun, man. Yeah, you've got good energy. It was fun chatting. Uh, always good talking with someone that <clears throat> is as knowledgeable because sometimes i'm like i'll reference something and they're like i don't know what you're talking about so, <laughs> <laughs> always good to have a fellow uh, big rpg fan 
the chat. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to have a secret exclusive coming up, an RPG kind of face-off in a, in a show called Figuring Out. Taylor, you're one of the participants, and we've got some mm. of our fellow RPG friends. We've got uh, Zygor Gaming. We've got Super Derek. We have maybe the Kaseki Nut as well. Um, we might have David Inc. We'll see who else we can get on board, but uh, it should be a fun round. Looking forward to it. Yeah, no, that'll be a blast. I know all those guys pretty well, so that should be fun. Excellent, excellent. So until next time, guys, cheers for watching. And uh, yeah, make sure to subscribe to the channel below and peace.